Amy Wu has a problem. After her teacher reads the class a book about dragons, Amy tries to create the perfect one. All the dragons that her classmates create are on the show and tell table, but one spot remains empty. Will Amy come up with an idea for her perfect dragon? Find out when author Kat Zhang talks about her delightful picture books, coming up next on Meet the Author. The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Welcome to Meet the Author. I'm your host, Emily Godfrey. I'm here in the MTA studio, and joining me virtually today is author Kat Zhang. Welcome, Kat. Hi. It's so great to be here with you guys today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to chat with you. Also joining us via Zoom are students from Colin Powell Elementary School. Hello, Powell. Hi. Kat has written the delightful picture book, Amy Wu and the Perfect Bow. Her latest book, Amy Wu and the Patchwork Dragon, has been selected to be read by Jumpstart's 16th annual Read for the Record Day, which is on October 28th. Congratulations, Kat, that's quite an accomplishment. Thank you so much. I was so excited to hear that Patchwork Dragon was going to be the Read for the Record book. Um, it's so awesome to know that kids from all over the world are going to be reading it together on this day. And it's given me the opportunity to chat to so many awesome educators and kids all across the country about Amy and her books. Well, for our viewers who don't know, Read for the Record is the world's largest shared reading experience bringing people together across the country and around the world to read the same book on the same day and to share the joy and connection of reading and to celebrate literacy. So our Powell students are eagerly awaiting to ask you some questions. So let's take a few. Who has the first question for Ms. Sang? Why did you want to be an author? That's a great question. Thanks so much for being here and chatting with me. I wanted to be an author ever since I was really little because I grew up loving to read books. Um, and pretty soon I started experiencing times when I had a story that I really wanted to read, but it hadn't been written yet. So I figured that the best way to make these stories come to life was to write them by myself. Um, and that's sort of how I got into writing. Who has the next question? Hi, what's your name and what's your question? My name is Catherine, and my question is, were the Amy Wu books based on your life or imagination? Thanks so much for your question, Catherine. Um, the Amy Wu books are partly based on my real life experiences and partly from imagination. So the first one, Amy Wu and the Perfect Bow, uh, is about a little girl, Amy, and I actually have a doll of her here. Um, and her experience is trying to make bow, which I have an example of here. If you don't know, bao are a kind of uh, Chinese bun, and they have all sorts of fillings inside. And I got inspired to write Amy Wu and the Perfect Bao because I used to make bao with my family when I was little. Um, and when I thought back on those experiences, I remembered how fun it was, but also how kind of frustrating it was sometimes because I always wanted to make bao that were just as good as those my parents made, but they didn't turn out quite as nice. So that's how I got inspired for that book. And for Amy Wu and and the Patrick Dragon, it is based in part on experiences that I had when I was a kid um, because I was often the only Asian American kid at my class or even my school. Um, and whenever we wanted to talk about, you know, dragons and things like that, almost everybody else thought about Western dragons, but I would often imagine Eastern dragons. So I wanted to write a story for Amy in which she kind of experienced the same things. Well, thank you for that answer. We have another question. Hi, student. What's your name and what's your question? My name is Evan. Um, where did you get the inspiration to write all your books? Thanks so much for your question. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about my inspiration for the first two Amy Wu books. I think in general, 
writers get inspiration from all over the place. Definitely, it's common for people to get inspired by real things that happen to them, like the way I was inspired for the first two Amy books. But I also get inspired by listening to other people's stories, like my friends' stories or things that I hear on the news or even other stories that I read in other books. But if I want things to just be slightly different, then I take that story idea, but I change things around and I add my own ideas and I make a completely new book. So inspiration sort of comes from all over. All right, we have one more question right now. Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Um, my name is Claire and my question is, do you like dragons? <laughs> Hi, Claire. It's so good to chat with you. I love dragons. I think they're so cool. I love imaginary creatures of all kinds, uh, especially creatures that have stories about them that go back hundreds and hundreds of years. I think it's so cool that the same stories that we're hearing now are some of the stories that people told way, way long ago, and they've been passed down through the ages. Um, and I think dragons are just so cool. Who doesn't love a dragon, right? <laughs> I love dragons, they are so cool, so cool. So those are some great questions and we'll come back to you a bit later in the show. Do you have a question for Kat Zhang? You can join our conversation as well. We welcome your calls at the number below. So speaking of dragons, in Amy Wu and the Perfect Dragon, you have a fun activity page at the end of the book and you give descriptions of an Eastern dragon and a Western dragon. I've never knew there was a distinction. Can you explain this a little bit? Yeah, so like I said, um, dragons are something that have existed in our culture for a long time and have existed in cultures, I think, all across the world. I'm sure there are actually way more kinds of dragons than even just the kind that I talk about in Amy Wu and the Patrick Dragon, the Eastern Dragon and the Western Dragon. I'm sure there are other cultures out there that have their own version of the dragon as well. Um, but these are the two that are most familiar to me. So the Western Dragon, I'm sure almost everybody that's grown up in the US or, you know, have experience with these, these like sort of greedy creatures and stories. They always hoard gold and they, you know, they kidnap princesses and like princes and knights have to go rescue them. Um, whereas the Eastern dragon is really different. Um, they tend to be seen as these really wise, just creatures. Um, and it, the heroes and stories often go to them for wisdom and advice about what to do. They're just as powerful as Western dragons, but actually instead of being associated associated with fire, like Western dragons usually are, they're associated with water and they're often said to control the rain and to be the ones who, you know, bring rain to a really drought ridden um, country or things like that. I thought it was really cool how, you know, dragons are so different, but also they have a lot of similarities too. Like both of them are kind of reptilian in nature. They have these like, you know, scales and they have these sort of like long snouts. Um, and they're both these enormous creatures that are said to fly <clears throat> through the sky. So it's really cool to me that, you know, these two different cultures have dragons that are both definitely recognizable as dragons and have a lot of similarities, but also are so different. Thank you so much for that explanation. It sounds like a great research project, right? For kids to learn more about different cultures and their myths and legends. It just sounds so neat to me as a librarian. <laughs> so oh, our, <laughs> our Powell students took a page right out of your book and created their own dragons. Let's brag on them for a moment and take a look.
that. Those were amazing. Thanks so much for sharing them. It's so awesome to see all the different projects that kids have built after reading Amy Wu and the Patrick Dragon. There is, you know, that, you know, the, the activity we included at the end, but so many uh, teachers and librarians and parents have shown me pictures of projects that they come up with their own. And I think it's so amazing that it's been a jumping off point for kids to be creative. I agree. It must feel really inspiring to you, too, and heartwarming to see the cool things they make. Definitely. One of the, I think, you know, as an author, you spend so much time working, you know, with your own team, with the illustrator, with all the awesome people on your publishing team, creating this project, but you don't really get to know how people are going to react to it until, you know, many years down the road when the book sort of spread its wings and goes out into the world and you sort of cross your fingers and you hope that people will enjoy it and get something out of it. And it's so rewarding after all the hard work that everybody's put in, um, that people are reacting so well and are, are loving the story. Well, let's go to an email question now. The stories about Amy Wu honor aspects of her cultural heritage. Why is this a topic important for you to write about? This is a great question. So it's definitely really important to me that Amy's stories and all of the Amy Wu stories focus on something that is sort of understandable for all kids. So, you know, in Perfect Bow, it's about the frustration of not being as good at something as you want to be, not being as good as the grown-ups or the older people in your life. And for Patrick Dragon, it's about, you know, wanting to be true to yourself and wanting to express yourself in your art and your projects. But at the same time, I always want to make sure that each Amy Wu book also does reflect her cultural heart heritage and how important that is to her. Um, as someone who didn't get to read a lot of books growing up um, about kids who were Asian American um, and who really wants to contribute to this sort of um, cultural diversity in children's literature now, it's really important to me that there are more books out there about Asian American kids so that not only can Asian kids see themselves in their books um, and have that sort of representation, but that kids who aren't Asian also are able to learn more about Asian culture and that it normalizes it because there are definitely so many Asian Americans in America today, um, and it's important that everybody understand what it's like um, to have this sort of cultural background. And I love that you included the recipe at the end of the book, too. Yeah, that was something that I was really excited to do um, because I love making bao and I love how it's given so many people their first taste of bao, whether it's from the recipe or just from going out and finding them at the grocery store or their nearest restaurant. So was that your family recipe? It's sort of my family recipe. I think, um, as a lot of people probably understand, my family traditionally cooks from the kind of, oh, just like keep adding stuff until it feels right or it looks right kind of school of cooking. Um, so it's really hard to put that down in a recipe. So I started off definitely with the kind of recipe that I would have used growing up. But to make it easier on everyone, I did sort of standardize everything into actual measurements and not just add things <laughs> into the team, right? <laughs> well, thank you, because when I try to use it later, I'm going to need that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go back to some questions from our students at Powell. Hi, student. What is your name and what is your question? My name is Jude, and my question is, is it hard to become an author? That's a great question. Thanks so much for asking it. It can be hard to become an author. Um, just like I think it's hard to do a lot of things, um, but at the same time, I find it really, really rewarding. And I think it's definitely something that anybody could do if it's something that you want to do. Uh, I think the way to start is to just start writing. Write about the experiences you have, write about all the little characters that come to your mind. And over time, with lots of practice, I think that anybody could be an author if they wanted to be. Thank you. Who has the next question? Hi, student. What is your name and what is your question? My name is Juha and my question is, what genre do you like the best? Thanks for asking me. I like all different kinds of genres. When I was growing up, I think my favorite genres to read were science fiction and fantasy. I liked stories about magic and about adventure and kids traveling to other worlds. As I got older, I still love those kind of books a lot, but now I also like books about everyday normal experiences too. So I guess I like all different kinds. 
All right, who has the next question? Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Hi, I'm Sean and my question is, do you write books in other languages? Oh. Ooh, that's a good question. So I don't write books in other languages, unfortunately. Um, I do speak Mandarin and I speak a little Spanish, but unfortunately I don't think my grasp of those languages is quite good enough for me to write a whole book in another language. I do know that um, for the Read for the Record event, um, Simon and & Schuster and um, the Jumpstart folks came together and it's really exciting. They created a Spanish language version of Amy Wu and the Patrick Dragon and also an online uh, Chinese version as well so that people can read them in those languages, which I think is awesome. But I did not write them because I'm not good enough in those languages. <laughs> Not good enough yet, right? <laughs> we can always do better. All right. And we have one more question right now. Hi, what's your name and what's your question? My name is Eliana, and my question is, what other books did you write besides Amy Wu books? That's an awesome question. So I started off writing for teenagers. So I wrote a young adult series for kids age about 13 to 18 ish. Um, and then I actually started going younger. So I wrote a couple of books for kids in middle school. Um, and then after that, I decided, hey, I want to reach kids who are even younger than that. So I started writing my picture book series. And in the future, I definitely do want to go back to writing for young adults and for middle graders, because I don't know, I think it's really interesting to be able to write for different ages. I think there's different stories you can tell that sort of um, resonate with kids of different ages. And it's so fun to me to be able to reach everybody like that. Could you tell me a little bit more about your middle grade books? Yeah. So my first middle grade book um, is called The Emperor's Riddle. It's about a little Chinese American girl named Mia. And she is going to China as part of a summer trip with her family. And while she's on this trip, her aunt, who is sort of her special person in her family, the person she feels most connected to, goes missing. And Mia is convinced that the reason her aunt has gone missing is because somebody has kidnapped her because of her aunt's knowledge of this ancient Ming Dynasty treasure. Now, Mia's aunt is a little bit flighty, so the other adults in Mia's life kind of think that, oh, maybe she just wandered off. Like, don't worry, Mia, she'll be back. But Mia is convinced, like I said, that her aunt has been kidnapped. Um, and so she discovers a series of riddles that she thinks will lead not only to this Ming Dynasty treasure, but to her aunt. So together with her older brother, they work together to solve these riddles, put together a secret map, and hopefully rescue her aunt. Um, so that's Emperor's Riddle. And the second book is called The Memory of Forgotten Things. This is a really special book to me because it talks about grief and the unfortunate story of uh, Sophia, who has unfortunately lost her mother at a really young age. Um, but the strange thing is, even though her mom died when she was around six years old, she has memories of things that happen after the age of six that her mother is in. For example, she remembers her mom helping celebrate her 10th birthday or celebrating Christmas with her when she was 11. And those things couldn't have happened because her mom had already passed by that time. Um, she meets these two other boys um, in her small town, one of which also has memories of things that never happened. He has memories of this stepfather who he's never even met before, but he can picture him so well that he draws him in his sketchbooks. And the three of them realize that these memories are becoming more and more frequent, and they become obsessed with the idea that they're connected to this solar eclipse that's going to happen and that they're going to be able to see from their small town and that maybe, just maybe, something really special is going to happen during the solar eclipse and maybe these memories they're having are actually glimpses into a parallel universe in which um, Sophia's mom never passed and in which DJ uh, has his stepdad. So they want to figure out how and if it's even possible that during this solar eclipse, they might be able to cross over into these parallel worlds and live these other lives that they don't actually have. Well, thank you. I can't wait to check those out. Those sound amazing. Thank you. <laughs>
So boys and girls, thank you so much for those questions. If time permits, we will come back to you a little bit later in the show. So the characters in Amy Wu books are very expressive. How close to your vision of these characters did your illustrator get? Yeah, so I work with Charlene Chua, who is amazing. Um, from the very beginning, she asked me, you know, do you have any particular vision in mind for these characters? Like, are there any reference photos you would like me to look at or anything like that? And to be honest, I told her to sort of, you know, have almost pretty much free reign over them because I know how important it is as, a, as an artist, as a creator, to be able to bring your own artistic vision. And to be honest, I think that they look almost exactly the way I imagined them to be and that Amy is so vibrant and expressive and spunky and her family is so loving. Um, and Charlene was even able to bring in parts to the story that are now so dear to me, but that weren't even in the original story, like Amy's kitten. Um, I think to me and to a lot of readers, Amy's kitten is one of the best parts of the story. Um, and is definitely an essential part of every book now going forward. But this was something that wasn't even a part of the original story and was something that Charlene added. And I think that's just so representative of how important it is to have an amazing illustrator and um, everything that they bring to a picture book series. And it just shows how much as an author you do have to collaborate. You have to collaborate with many other types of artists as you work on your journey to finish a book. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's, you know, people think of writing as being this very isolated, you know, one person job, but it's really not the case. You work with your editors, you work with your marketing team, you work, if you're writing a picture book, you work with the illustrator. It's definitely a group project. Well, right now we are going to take a short break with a mini grammar lesson about homophones. If you're wondering what makes a homophone, don't worry, Pirate Pete is here to explain. Ahoy, matey, let's spell like a pirate. Words that sound alike and are spelled differently and have a different meaning are called homophones. Two, two, two. Two, T-O. Get to shore. Two, T-W-O. Arr, I see two sharks. Two, T-O-O. -O. I see shark's teeth, too. Two, Link's ideas. Two represents number two. Two means also. that sound alike and are spelled differently and have a different meaning are called homophones. Arr, let's spell like a pirate. Homophones are a tricky part of English grammar, but Pirate Pete gave a pretty good explanation. Don't you agree, Kat? No, definitely. <laughs> well, we're almost out of time, so we'll give our Powell students the final question. So let's go to them now. Hello, students. Who has the final question for Miss Zhang? I know it's a good question, too. I heard it already. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Hi, my name is Kathy and my question is, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? Ooh, that's a great question. Also, my name is Kathy too, so that's awesome. Um, oh. I think my biggest advice for aspiring authors is to not be frustrated with yourself if you're not as good as you want to be at first. I think that's 
a great lesson we can learn from Amy when she's making her bow, um, that everybody is going to have trouble at first. Um, and I think a lot of people think about artistic things like writing and drawing as things that either you're good at or you're not. And if you're not good from the very beginning, then you might as well give up because you're just not gonna be good at them. I think we should think about them just like we think about other stuff, like playing a musical instrument or playing a sport or doing well in school or learning a new thing. Nobody, you know, picks up a violin on day one and can play like, you know, the experts. Nobody, you know, gets on the soccer field and suddenly can be the best person on the team. And it's the same for writing. You know, when you start off, you read all the books that you love to read and you want to write books just like that but most of the time you're not going to be that good when you first begin and that's totally normal and I think a lot of people unfortunately get frustrated at, at that point and they give up and we never get to see how good they can be so my biggest advice is tell yourself it's normal to not be as good as I want to be it's normal to feel frustrated and then just keep going that is fantastic advice well, thank you, Powell, for joining us today. You had wonderful questions. It was so lovely to have you with us. Thank you guys so much. It was great thank to you meet you guys. Bye. 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 And Kat, thank you so much for joining us and chatting about your wonderful picture books. It was really lovely to be here. I'm so happy I was invited. Thank you so much. If you would like to learn more about Kat Zhang, visit her website. To learn more about our upcoming programs, visit the Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Emily Godfrey. Keep reading, keep writing, keep dreaming. Thanks for watching.